not about any specific project in Maine. Rather, it's just an opportunity to learn more about various aspects of offshore wind. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to have two excellent speakers to cover um, offshore wind, offshore industry cabling practices, electric magnetic field in, um, information related to cables, and cable dynamics within an array. So thank you again for taking the time. We look forward to this discussion and presentations. Back Great. to you, Pat. Thank you, Selena. Really appreciate it. I just want to acknowledge, I noticed that um, uh, we have some uh, elected official representatives or at least staff here. So Senator Collins staff, delighted that you're here. May have others. And if you want to put in your chat, your affiliation, happy to note that. Um, and with that, Cameron, if we can go to the, the next slide, that would be great. Great. Okay. So, you know, we're all uh, tired of this, but here we are. Okay. Zoom reminders. So again, this is a webinar. So there's a fair amount of presentation, but absolutely time for questions. So do stay on mute during the presentation, just so we don't have sound interference. If you are on the phone, um, it's always a little confusing because sometimes it's a double whammy, but star six unmutes you and star six mutes you. Uh, and you can raise your hand. And I'll say this again when we have Q&A, star nine on the phone can raise your hand. Uh, on Zoom, if you want to raise your hand, it's actually at the bottom of your, of your screen on Zoom in the control sort of bar at the bottom, typically under reactions. And then your raise hand function is actually there, um, which you can do that there. You, uh, sometimes in older versions of Zoom, it's actually in the participant list. So sometimes you have to look both places just to let you know. Um, <clears throat> what we'll do is, um, and I'll go through the agenda in a minute, but generally there's presentations. Then we want to take questions. We can take those in really uh, two per primary ways. Raise your hand, call on you, um, and or if you want to put a question in chat, I will try to get to it. Um, we'll do our best to get to all the questions we can. We will stay on time. So if I have to cut folks off just to move on, I will, but I'll try not to do that so we get everybody in. Um, and obviously, we want people to ask good questions. We're happy to have a discussion. Uh, what we want to do is just people be respectful, mindful of time, try to keep your question as brief as you can, just so other folks have time to ask their questions as well. Um, next slide. Okay, um, so um, I think, Selena, we, we have this here. I don't know if you want to say more about the general approach to Maine's offshore wind approach, and maybe I'll let you speak to that, and I'll go to one last slide on the agenda. Sure, so um, the state of Maine is exploring uh, the opportunity of offshore wind for the state. Um, and as we, we are doing this, there are a ver variety of different um, uh, init parts of the initiative that we are exploring. But through all of it, we are taking a measured and deliberate approach. We are working with stakeholders and, and others to answer questions and, and explore these opportunities. We really value our, our ability to work and coordinate with our regional states, partners, um, and other agencies and, and, and stakeholders. And we um, are, have a commitment to, to listen to our, and engage with our stakeholders. So that's something that we carry through all of our work on offshore wind. Hey, thank you, Selena. Uh, next slide, Cameron. All right, so yeah, go ahead and one more, sorry about that. That's just, uh, that's our, our, our nice entry slide. Okay, so here's our plan for today. Uh, <clears throat> we are gonna do kind of an overview of transmission cables generally for offshore wind. And this actually in some ways applies to offshore wind, but other reasons that you have cables as well. As you know, there's been cables in the water for, for, for decades, I don't know, maybe centuries, I'm not sure. Um, and so uh, Joel Whitman, who I'll introduce in a minute is gonna speak to that. That's about 15 minutes. And then we're gonna take a break and take questions and answers for about 10. Um, and then um, we know of interest is trying to understand better electric magnetic frequency radiation and potentially its effect on biology, biology habitat, organisms. And so we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Zoe Hutchinson, who will be talking about EMF and electrified cables um, in general and what we know and don't know and what research is out there regarding that. So Zoe will speak also for about 15 minutes and then we'll give about 10, 15 minutes for questions. She does have a hard stop at 11. Um, to do other things. And so we'll have to kind of wrap that piece up there, but that gives us just right, because then we'll go back to Joel and talk very specifically, given the, the strong likelihood of primarily offshore floating technology in Maine about what's called dynamic cabling. And Joel then will speak specifically to some of the cabling within a floating array and what that means, how it's different and the like. Um, and so really appreciate his expertise in doing that. Um, okay. With that, um, why don't you, Cameron, unshare our screen? I'm going to have Joel go ahead and put up his slides, and I'll introduce Joel as he does that. Okay. Um, great. So Joel is, leads the Global Marine Group's North American Business Operations from the U.S. office in Boston. He's an executive vice president and brings almost 20 years of offshore wind industry knowledge. He's worked across a range of different industries during his career, including renewable energy, software, retail, chemical manufacturing, 
subsea robotics and telecommunications. He's demonstrated his expertise developing and launching new products and services around the world and has a keen understanding of the implications and requirements of new offshore wind technology. Uh, Joel serves as a board member for the Business Network for Offshore Wind and the U.S. Offshore Wind Collaborative, and we're really delighted to have him today. So thank you so much, Joel, and over to you. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Stephanie. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk through uh, offshore wind cabling this morning. Um, as a quick overview, Pat kind of gave my background. I'm going to focus on a, a more general uh, overview of transmission installation on the first part of this, and then we'll talk about dynamic cabling uh, as we go in. Uh, the company I work for, I think is an interesting, just for context, um, has been around since the 1860s. And that's important in that the art of cabling in the offshore space has been around that long. So Pat just mentioned it a minute ago. Um, we have been installing cables around us and other companies too, of all types around the world since the middle of the 1800s. Uh, obviously the way it's done has evolved, um, but the art of doing it has been something that is a, a constant. So as such, our company specializes in both telecommunications, which is the global marine side of the business, and then power cables, which we're gonna talk about today, which is the global offshore side of the business. And in between those two things are two business units. SeaWind is a services business that tends to be for us, all the services related to um, uh, supporting the uh, operations and maintenance of the wind farm, and then also support services during the installation comes into play uh, for terminations and cable pulls and things like that, which I'll talk about. And then uh, our Ocean IQ business uh, works a lot with um, consultants to help uh, test the constructive, well, design routes, but then test the constructability of those routes. So as projects are developed in certain areas, uh, the local geography, local regulations, um, the local use space, uh, is going to obviously have a significant impact on how that project rolls out. And so having advisors that have um, built these before and when you have the idea of a permit versus the idea of constructability and you make sure those things come together, that's what those guys do. Um, and then the other thing that they do that's worth noting, whether you look at ours or somebody else's because there's other companies that do this too, is they maintain a database of all the cables in the world. Now you can, when you look at, for example, all the cables coming into the East Coast of the United States, most of those cables are transoceanic uh, telecoms cables because that's how the internet works um, and telephones and the like. Um, and most of those have the best routes. And so one of the key parts of our industry is to make sure that in offshore wind that we're coexisting with the infrastructure that's already on the seabed because a lot of that's been there for a while and and, and work, being good neighbors to them is uh, fundamental. So understanding what's there, how it works and how it comes together is kind of really important to doing a good project. Um, so these are the kind of considerations that we think about when, when you're thinking about making a good offshore transmission. Um, I'm gonna hide this so I can see the whole screen. So an offshore transmission uh, environment. I'm not gonna speak about transmission design as it relates to the grid, uh, because that's a whole different area of expertise. This is more focused on the mechanics of um, transmission installation. Um, it's impossible to say that this is the right way to do it versus the wrong way to do it, because the ecosystem, for example, in the Gulf of Maine is completely different than south of Cape Cod, um, which again is completely different if you go down to New Jersey or, or the coast of Virginia. And again, is different when you go over to the North Sea. So the, the coastal marine ecosystem is vast and diverse and it's irreplaceable. So anything that you're building uh, needs to be done so in a way that is uh, sensitive to what's going on in that local environment. And if it's designed that way and constructed that way, then it'll be operate that way. If it's not, problems will occur. And there's great examples of both. Um, limited experience here in the United States with utility scale electrical infrastructure in the marine setting is gonna be one of the opportunities, but one of the realities of our industry. Just to give you an example, in the European market, we've been installing power cable for offshore wind for 15 years or so. So there are thousands of kilometers in, in, of cable in the water. And over that, that's a large volume. Uh, I think there's probably over a thousand, probably more than that these days if you connect, if you count ex, uh, interconnectors. 
uh, being installed every year. So you have this vast amount of experience and this vast amount of cable infrastructure in the water there that you just don't have here. And so that limited experience means that we need to be really smart about how we design these and learn from that experience so we don't learn the same lesson twice. Um, the, the, the key component too that comes across my desk a lot is we've already got existing users, commercial users, environmental considerations. How do we coexist with them both from a planning stage and then from a build stage and from an operate stage? So I mentioned that earlier and that's fundamental in the way you design this kind of stuff. And the common issues that relate to cable infrastructure construction are largely the same, whether it's gonna be a point to point system like a backbone or whether it's gonna be an array field. Um, and then understanding those principles and then how they apply specifically to a geography is, makes a successful project. At the end of the day, um, uh, well, and then let me one last point that a lot of the purpose built vessels and equipment that's being used today in the European market has come about recently because uh, the first stage, you know, first five or 10 years of the industry was all kind of stealing technology from uh, oil and gas or from telecoms. And we would apply that and it was okay. But now you're starting to see really purpose-built equipment, purpose-built vessels. Uh, and those really make the difference when it comes to a smooth quality installation. Uh, and getting those available over here via Jones Act new builds or via some type of a equipment transfer makes a, um, a world of difference when it comes to, again, installing it using the right tool for the job. Uh, obviously the goal is to maximize throughput, electrical throughput, while minimizing marine environmental impact and, co and, and maximize coexistence with existing users. If you do that, you've got a successful project. And I think the industry has done a good job of really building that experience up for over, the, um, over the last decade. One last big picture point, and then I'll get into the weeds of transmission, is this is a, a map, this shows you where we are, but more important, and, and that you have depots and that you have vessels and equipment around the world, you could lay our competitors maps and they would look very similar. But the things that are important to jump out here, NAS, ACMA, SEACMA, these are long-standing cable maintenance agreements between the telecommunications companies. This is the internet. So if we're here, this, this right now is, is going across the cables that are being managed already. There's a history of maintaining cables in a way that has a big picture, not just a one at a time approach. And I would really suggest, and we're obviously involved as possible, um, that thinking about that at scale becomes a way to think about, well, what are other industries doing to maintain a set of cables, a group of cables? How are they co-existing with the local fisheries? Or how are they demonstrating environmental compliance? And what is the frequency of inspections? All those things are handled in agreements like this. And certainly we have a lot to learn from that as the offshore wind industry matures. The um, Snapshot of what you're doing when you're doing an offshore wind cable infrastructure. This is a good kind of cutaway. If you look in here, starting on the shore, you have the cable going out to a substation. Substation, again, this is a fixed space example. I'll talk about floating a bit later. Uh, between the substation here and then the wind farm here, there's your, you know, your one turbine or your hundred turbines, whatever it is. Uh, in a pilot, you're not going to have a substation. You just run that to shore. But the principle is that the substation is aggregating all of the cables coming in. So you'll have a string of 10 turbines. You'll have 10 strings of those 10 turbines. They all meet here at the substation. And then from there, it's stepped up to a high voltage cable, which then goes back to shore. So that we call that an export cable. And that this can be as far as a couple hundred miles offshore, or it can be as near as I think here in the US, the most, the closest one you might see is gonna be, I don't know, 15 miles, 20 miles, certainly far enough offshore so that's largely over the horizon, you don't really see it. From shore, that's the whole issue, putting it out there. And certainly in the Gulf of Maine, when you're dealing with deeper waters, um, you have uh, the opportunity to place them even further offshore uh, as appropriate. And that's what California is looking at right now, as well as uh, you guys are thinking about up in Maine. The export cable is the high voltage aspect of this. That's usually, uh, well, usually these days, it's almost always buried. And then it's brought to shore and uh, it comes into the shoreline, usually via a beach uh, cut or it's via an HDD duct. And I'll talk about those. Uh, 
Beyond that, you have the array infrastructure. This is the medium voltage side of things. And we'll talk about that in the second presentation. Um, one of the things that gets asked a lot is uh, burial equipment. If you're laying the cable, uh, the way that it works, and let me jump back to this one. If you're, uh, if you're laying the cable from shore or from the substation, normally it's front, you would have a HDD duct put in here. You would have the vessel come near there. It comes off the back of the vessel, through the H is pulled through the HDD duct and is terminated at the appropriate place, usually some type of a coffer dam um, on the beach side or uh, usually it's a parking lot or somewhere near the beach side. That's terminated and then the cable is surface laid uh, all the way back out here to the substation. If it's a longer run, you'll see these, uh, rather than surface laid, you'll actually see a plow on the vessel that will then plow the vessel, plow the cable in right from there. So it's buried at the same time. It all depends on the geography and it depends on the uh, length of the, uh, the distance of the project, whether it's plowed or buried. Um, either way, very tried and true technology. In this case, I'm showing you a uh, trenching ROV, pretty common way to bury cable, in which case the cable would have been surface laid. Uh, and then you go back with this ROV. And the idea is the, uh, the ROV, it, the cable is laid on the seabed and the ROV is actually running its, I don't know if it's going to come through, but it's a little video. It's running these blades that are liquefying the seabed. There you go. That's a good one to stop at. It's essentially, you can see the cable right here and it's liquefying the seabed and the cable drops into the trench. And then as, as it goes, most seabeds will then backfill almost immediately. Then you go back and inspect it for the backfill and anything that hasn't been buried correctly or to depth gets extra attention in the way of some type of um, remediation. It could be in the form of mattresses. It could be you go take another pass with the ROV or it could be uh, rocks or whatever is appropriate to that location. Um, and these types of ROVs can bury the cable. I think this idea in the US, most of the spec I'm seeing is up to two meters, six feet. Um, these can go as up as deep as three meters. Uh, some circumstances, it, it's important to go deeper. It all depends on the location. But the equipment, as I said earlier, is now purpose built for this, these kind of runs. And it is uh, designed to minimize the impact uh, on the environment. And uh, we can talk about those or happy to answer questions uh, as we go here. Here's a picture of what a cable vessel looks like. This is one of ours. This one's set up to lay array vessel, uh, array cable. Uh, the primary difference between an array vessel and a export vessel is the amount of cable that would be on the back deck. Uh, and then you would have a plow also operating from the back deck. And then you would also have a, the ability for that vessel to go really close to shore. So um, if you look at the um, cutaway of a, an export cable vessel, it will oftentimes self ground so that you don't need to have a barge in there working the shallow aspect of things. Uh, and those vessels can carry up to, some of the newer ones can carry up to 10,000 tons of cable. Why you do that is because that way you don't have to put a joint in at sea and get it as long a run as possible. Some of the cables that are going in in Europe right now are running for hundreds of kilometers and these big interconnector projects require that volume. Around here, um, you might be able to get one run in if you're using a vessel like that. And if it can self ground, you can get as near shore as possible, minimizing the near shore works. Um, an array vessel is different in that uh, it's obviously focused on moving close up to the foundation and being able to work from the foundation. And then if it is being used to, to lay the cable back to shore, then you would float the cable in. I think I have a picture there. I do. So on the shore side of things, this kind of shows three different examples of how this is the cable obviously coming to shore. It's either been pulled or a beach cut or an HDD duct, as I mentioned earlier. This shows that there would be a big winch back on shore that's pulling the cable ashore. Um, and it is then terminated on shore. And then you can see here, there's the vessel. It's clearly marked so that the process itself um, doesn't take that long, but you often do have, you show so some guard boats that are making sure no one crosses the path of the cable while it's being laid. Um, and then you would also run an inspection over it if you've uh, recently buried to make sure it's where it's supposed to be. Then it's put on a chart or it's put into the database so that everybody knows uh, where that cable is. And then it's frequently 
whatever the local permits say, inspected to make sure it's staying put. Um, and we can talk about overburden and shifting the overburden or the difference between soft clays, sand, stiffer soils, and how that might impact the way a cable um, kind of lays in the seabed, both at installation and over time. Happy to answer those questions. But I think I've used up my time as a quick overview. Um, happy to take any questions now, or if you prefer, Pat, I can do it towards the end. No, I think that's great, Joel. Thank you. That's terrific. Again, a good taste, and then we're open for questions. So, and we'll take questions for about 10 minutes, and then we'll go to Zoe and then come back to Joel for floating. So, if people could try to focus their questions primarily on this kind of broad question of how you lay transmission cable, general questions on trans transmission cable, that's great. And then we will get to floating specifically a little bit later today. So, uh, again, you can raise your hand uh, and or put a question in chat. And Jocelyn, you're first. Just make sure to unmute yourself, and I'll let you know that we can hear you. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh um, I just had a quick question, and maybe this might be better for the floating section, but um, I was curious about the substations. Are, are those fixed or in our situation in the Gulf of Maine, would that be a floating um, substation also? Just wondering sort of what that technology uh, looks like. Sure. So Again, I, I wouldn't want to say specifically what's the right thing for Maine, but in principle, when you're dealing with deeper water, you're getting beyond the point where you can cost effectively put a, um, a jacket underneath a, a substation. So in oil and gas floating uh, oil rigs are very common, uh, deeper water around Norway, for example, um, we've done interconnectors out to floating rigs out there. So I don't see for a wind farm it, that the principles would be that different. So what you would do is you would anchor, you'd have a, in, in principle, again, uh, a floating substation that would uh, take in all of the array cables and then have a dynamic cable to the seabed. Uh, and then from there, it would just be, as I just described, viewing the export cable back to shore. And I'm sure that that would be anchored to the, I mean, off the shelf these days, it would be anchored to the seabed using the types of anchoring systems that would be common for oil and gas. Uh, but I do think that there's probably opportunity for innovation there as we think about how to minimize uh, footprints, especially when we have the opportunity to do something new and different. So um, I would say at, 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 at a first blush, the oil and gas floating oil rig would provide us what a floating uh, transmission piece at that scale would look like. Great, and there's a, a question to maybe Joel, and this is getting a little bit into offshore te floating technology, but I think I'll, I'll get to that because it's related into others, is that is it possible to do cabling through these wind farms without a substation? So there's not actually a substation as part of the array. Again, um, I've seen some interesting, I'm not the transmission expert on the top side, but. I've seen some interesting new designs or concepts out there where rather than having one substation, you have smaller versions of a substation uh, at the front or cable number, or turbine number one of a string. Um, and this is an interesting way to go conceptually if, it, you know, again, if the design works from the electrical engineering point of view, but conceptually, because then you don't have a single point of failure on the substation um, and you could then bring those back. Now to do that though, you would, you would need a wider corridor, I would expect, for your export cables. But again, just like telecommunications, having redundancy in your export cables would de-risk the fact that you know you have um, a fault in a cable. Then all of a sudden, the whole wind farm is uh, not you're not able to get your power back to shore. So yeah, I've seen some interesting designs, and I think the deeper water will really push those ideas forward. Great. Um, then there's a question specifically about uh, directional drilling, and I think the question is. You know, in regards to HDD from shore, how long a run are you aware of? How long do you think it is technically possible now? And will that actually change over five years where you can even drill sort of you know, greater distances? Sure. I would not be the right person to say the longest ever possible, but you know, you, a kilometer, kilometer uh, plus is not, that un, is not that unusual. It's a long run, but it's not that unusual. Um, going further than that, I'm not so sure the benefit of doing it beyond that, but it's a pretty, not a pretty, it's a very mature technology. We don't see a lot of HDD up here because our infrastructure hasn't required it. Um, river crossings, uh, you start to see where they go all the way HDD if it, if it works and the budget will work that way. It's a great way to go because it's a mature technology and you'd never, you know, from the beach side, certainly from the folks, folks that are worried about a beach cut or worried about 
an estuary that you have an environment, you know, environmental considerations very specific to a, a um, sensitive environmental area, it's an excellent way to go because you're essentially going right under it and you're popping up beyond it. And so I would be the last person to give you what your, your limitations are, but I would guess um, it, would, it would work for most of the, the environment that I've seen here in the Northeast. And I think it'll be continuing to mature over the next decade because we're going to be doing more of it. That's great. Um, there, I think there's a question, I think, and uh, we've certainly, uh, many people have posed this, which is kind of how are cables set on different kinds of bottoms? So you might want to talk about like sandy, muddy, rocky, and then just plain old bedrock. Um, like sure. how do you handle those different uh, substrates? Yep. So during the routing process, it's really important to have a clear picture of what's happening there. So, you know, you have your seabed surveys, um, sometimes you'll, you'll, you know, get core surveys. So you get a sense of how, you know, how deep is realistic to bury it. The ideal is you're going to want to bury it as much as possible. Now you think, well, sand, that's easy, but sand's volatile. And so th there's, there's tables that exist in the industry that kind of handicap, um, the volatility of a seabed versus the stiffness of the soil. And how do you design a route to maximize uh, the burial depth with minimizing your volatility. You don't want to put a cable across sand waves, for example. It's easy to install. It's impossible to stay buried. So when you're designing the route, you're, you're maximizing the buryability of the cable. In the case where you get, um, you know, bedrock or you get scour, then you're going to bring in things like, well, maybe it's a surface lay or it's a shallow lay that I'm not going to get as deep as I want to be, and I want to put in something like a mattress or uh, rock dumping is popular. In that case, it's really important to interface with commercial fish, the local commercial fisheries, specifically the local commercial fisheries. There's no general thing about it. It's more specific to what's the type of fishing that they do there. And then, and, and also the sport fisheries too, because that has impact. And then you would design the mattress or you would design the, the cable protection that you'd put in to minimize the impact uh, on the folks being able to fish the way that they are used to fishing in that area. And that's a collaborative process. If you do it correctly, if the route's designed correctly, installed correctly, and mattress are protected correctly, should have a very minimal impact. If you don't do those things in the planning, then you, know, you spend the next, you spend, you know, it, it becomes a problem in the future. And there's no reason for us to have that because we have the experience of Europe and elsewhere where they've already learned these lessons. And so, we apply them now, it should be manageable. Great, thanks, Joel. Next question is, is are you know, remote vehicles the only or primary manner in which cables are buried? Are there any other industry practices? And there's a second part to that question, okay, too, but just first kind of like, is that primarily now the only way you do it or are there multiple ways, et cetera? Yeah, so, so Maine's a good example. You guys have had, most of the islands I think now are, are cabled up one way or the other. So you've been laying cables to, uh, to network together, to put the islands on a power grid for a long time. Uh, those, if the, you know, if you had a cable laid in the 1950s, it's largely, it's probably still there and it's probably still surface laid. These cables can last a good long time if they're done correctly. These days, burying it is the way to go. Um, if you're far off, 200, 300 miles offshore, it means a different conversation, um, but you're going to want to bury it. And the state of the art is using a ROV because it's, it, it's very high precision. The tools that we use, our competitors use that are purpose built for this. You can be very precise about the route and you can be very precise about where the cable went. So you know uh, from a hazard navigation hazard or from uh, in future inspections, you know exactly what you've got there. Um, there are some you know, places where you could see you know, using divers to help a particularly tricky spot. That's designed you know, to be, that's ideally to be avoided because it's a higher risk uh, method to do it. Not done very often except for in tricky parts. Um, and then the plowing, like I mentioned, is very common. So like a high voltage line that's got a high voltage cable, export cable, that's going to run for, you know, dozens of kilometers, you would just use a plow for that because you can get it all in one go. So a, a export cable vessel is going to come with a plow. Uh, I didn't have one in my Prezzo, but it's going to come with a plow and that'll do the job pretty well. And then you go back and hit any areas that weren't buried all the way with an, an, an ROV. Right. I've got two more questions for you, then we'll go to Zoe just because of time. And, and we can continue on when we come back to you, Joel, for sure. So the next question is like, how long does it take to lay a nautical mile? Now, I realize that's probably not a simple answer. At least give a range of like, like, is this, you know, is this something that takes 
weeks on end delay. No, no, no. Yeah. So if you're obviously you're spinning up and spinning down and the volume of a project is you know, the number of cables you're laying and how efficient the vessel is laid out. So if you're using a proper cable ship, and, the, and it's, everything's warmed up and ready to go, you know, it's not the first cable of the day kind of thing, uh, or the first kilometer of the day, you know, you can, you can, you can lay, so you can be installing several kilometers of an export cable in a day. Once you're going, you're going. The speed with which you're installing it though is going to completely depend on the seabed conditions because the stiffer the soils, the slower you're gonna go, right? Because you, you need to give the tool, whether it's the plow, or later in ROV, uh, you need to give it the time to get the cable to the depth that it needs to be at. So, uh, but once you're set up and ready to go, it's a fairly steady progress. So interference, you know, getting in the way of other users, it's not, it's not as if you're um, blocking off traffic or, or navigation traffic or um, people crossing that cable for days on end. It's, it's something that should be done very, very quickly. Um, on an array field, then you would do that, um, and it, you would do that a, as a, you know, a pattern, if you will, over the field. We'll get into those in the second presentation. Great, Joe, that's great. And uh, one more question, I'm gonna hold one for when we come back, uh, but, but it's also a good question. So is it possible to have hubs on the seabed where say cables from various projects, if there are various projects, could tie into a cable that then goes landward so that you don't, you can minimize the number of cables that are going to land and, you know, all yeah. Like no, that's a good question. It gets asked a lot. And, um, you know, you see it in other industries like umbilicals where those can kind of Christmas tree together or uh, even telecoms cables where they're spliced together. I'm not an electrical engineer. So again, I'll defer to those guys, but the, the uh, an, if you will, a subsea um, connection point where multiple cables like that are coming together, sitting on the seabed, to me would be something that would be very hard to do uh, technically, if it's even possible, uh, because those aren't those kind of interconnections aren't designed to be wet. They're not designed to sit there on the seabed. So a substation, which is really where you're collecting that, does need to be dry. Um, I, I so you can splice a couple together. You can have some joints. You might even have a Y, uh, but those are going to be tend to be lower voltages. When you're dealing with the high voltages that an offshore wind farm is, that needs to be above the water. So. Again, if there's some electrical engineers that say, oh, no, no, here's the cutting edge, then I'll refer to them. But most of the substation, the collection aspect of it does need to be above water that I've ever seen. Great, that's great. Um, we, uh, I'm gonna hold this question. We'll come back to it, Joel, so just make sure I don't forget. The question about decommissioning cables. Well, let's hold that just because I know Zoe has a hard stop. So I want to get her, get her in and we'll come back. So yeah. thank you, great questions. Uh, we're gonna come back to Joel for floating and we'll answer that decommissioning question uh, right after Zoe's piece. So I'm gonna have Zoe share her screen. I'm gonna do a brief introduction and then we will uh, have her dive into EMF. So Zoe is a marine biologist uh, with a master's in science in aquatic resource management and a PhD in marine science. She's a postdoc research fellow at the University of St. Andrews and an honorary fellow of the Scottish Association for Marine Science. She has researched the environmental effects of offshore wind energy for 10 years and specializes in the topic of potential effects of electromagnetic fields on marine species. And she was recently based at the University of Rhode Island. So she's been on both sides of the pond as it were. Uh, and she was lead author of a very recent chapter in the December special issue of Oceanography entitled The Interaction Between Resource Species and EMF Fields Associated with Electricity Produced by Offshore Wind Farms. And she co-authored that with David Secor and Andrew Gill. And we are delighted to have you Zoe. So thank you so much for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Pat. Thanks very much for the invitation and, and for, for the introduction. So uh, with that, I'll just go straight on with the with the talk. Um, so I guess for uh, just for general background, uh, first to explain why, we're, why we care about electromagnetic fields from cables um, is really to focus on the natural side of things. So um, some species that are considered to have a, a the sensory system capabilities might be able to derive uh, important ecological cues from um, natural electromagnetic fields. And they can be things like the, the Earth's geomagnetic field, so they may be able to use that to help them um, figure out where they are uh, and, and locate themselves, uh, figure out where to go to get to important resources, uh, such as reproductive or feeding grounds, or they might be uh, responsive to bioelectric fields, um, which they can be important in predator-prey interactions, 
uh, to find mates or possibly in communication. There's a whole variety of ways in which they're used and that's why we're interested in electromagnetic fields from cables and how they may influence the marine species. So in this talk I'll just go through uh, what electromagnetic fields are and how we characterise them. I'll talk a little bit quite generally about um, the potential effects uh, on marine species and the methods that are used in those assessments. Um, and then I'll, I'll focus a little bit on uh, how we can advance our understanding and the broader context of offshore wind and the environmental effects. So first to, to try and explain what an electromagnetic field is. If I can hide this notification, thanks. Um, so the important thing to remember are that there are two components. So there is an electric field and a magnetic field, and that produces an electromagnetic field. We can break that down. So as you heard, I think you can have DC or AC cables. And in both cases, the electric field is contained within the cable sheathing. So if this is a cross section of the cable, that's the, the orange dot, the electric field is contained within that. However, the magnetic field is emitted into the environment, and that's the part that can interact with the, the marine environment. In addition to that, in the AC case, because it's a time altering state, um, it produces a, an induced electric field. So that's an, an additional component to an AC field. And in both cases for the DC and AC cables, if a fish or a water body passes through the magnetic field, that can give rise to a motionally induced electric field. So there's a variety of components to which marine species may respond to. In the context of subsea power cables associated with offshore wind, as you heard, uh, there's a variety of cables that, um, so you have the export cable to inter-array cables, and, and the, it's traditionally thought of as a benthic issue because they tend to be on the seabed, uh, where they can be buried, but if they might be exposed or have uh, these protections that were just mentioned, so concrete mattresses or rock armouring over the top. Um, and now we have the advent of floating uh, wind, which produces um, electromagnetic fields in the, the water column. So it's no longer just benthic issue, it could be benthic or pelagic uh, species that interact with this. So if we focus on the, the buried cable scenario at the moment, um, you can see a model here. This is a buried cable one metre below the seabed. You can see that the magnetic field portrays into the, the environment in a uniform manner, regardless of whether it's in the seabed or in the, the sea, it passes through both uh, in the same way. Whereas the electric field is dependent on the conductivity of the medium. So you can see that the seawater is more conductive and so the electric field propagates further than it does through the seabed. Um, and that will depend on the conductivity properties of the seabed and also the, the water content as well in the marine environment. Um, and so in terms of characterising electromagnetic fields from cables, uh, we tend to model them. And this is a variety of cables that were modelled by Norman Doe et al. Um, and you can see in the bottom, you have AC cables uh, down here. Um, I'll draw your attention to the, the scale here, which um, is a lower magnetic field intensity than the DC cables, which has a much higher field, sorry. Um, and so just to remind you that this is not from offshore wind, this is cables in general. Um, so but the, the thing to notice here is that you have a variety of different intensities from the cables and also different spatial arrays and distances along the seabed that could be affected. And that's due to the different cable properties um, and uh, also the power levels that are being passed through the cables. They influence the, the electromagnetic field. Um, and we do tend to focus on the magnetic field when we're doing these models. Um, however, we have worked on the cross sound cable. That's the cable in red just here. So it's a DC cable. Uh, it passes 330 megawatts and it was buried. Um, we used models and we measured it using this TOAD device that's shown there. And that allowed us to characterize the EMF in a little bit more detail. So it managed to take account of the different power levels that were passing through it and the variable burial depths that were achieved along the, the cable route. Um, and it also demonstrated the interaction with the, low, low, the local geomagnetic field. And so the signature was quite variable depending on the twist of the cable because it was a bipolar cable. And in addition to that, although we were measuring the EMF of a DC cable, we actually had AC fields associated with it. So the models are great and they're helpful, but in, in the realistic scenario, the, the EMFs that are emitted are maybe a little bit more complex. And so useful to build on that information going forward. So we turn our attention now to try and understand the EMF effects on marine species. Um, I'm going to talk quite broadly. This is not specific to offshore wind. It's just some of the studies that are available um, 
uh, it, and it gives you an idea of the diversity of species that could be affected by this. Um, so starting with the invertebrates, we have aquarium-based studies that have shown changes in burial behaviour uh, in polychaetes, and uh, both in the polychaetes and in uh, the bivalves that are shown there, there are evidence of cellular level responses to magnetic fields. Turning to the crustaceans, there's a variety of studies that are available. So we understand from aquarium-based studies that uh, the edible crab, for example, um, showed an, an attraction to shelters that were exposed to magnetic fields. In contrast, the rock crab and dungeness crabs that were um, studied uh, in AC fields, they didn't show any behavioral responses that were different between powered or unpowered cables. And so they concluded that they would still pass through the EMF unaffected and be able to obtain food and concluded that they could still be caught. Our study on the cross sound cable exposed uh, lobsters, American lobsters to uh, the DC EMF and they increased their exploratory behavior in response to the, the, the treatment. So that was the, the treatment mesocosm in which they were exposed. And then uh, in contrast, we have um, juvenile, uh, juvenile lobsters that were exposed in aquarium studies to AC and DC fields, and they didn't exhibit any um, behavioral responses to that. There's also been some concerns about the ability of animals to migrate and whether or not the migration abilities would be affected by EMFs. This comes from studies such as Westerberg of the European eel that slowed down over um, when it was passing over uh, buried cables. And uh, more recently, there's been studies of Chinook salmon uh, on their outward migration and they were showing an increased degree of misdirection, uh, which made them take longer to reach, their, uh, reach the sea, although they still completed their migration. And when we consider the elasmobranchs, we have a, a good understanding that the ability to detect bioelectric fields, such as those produced by predators, occurs very early on in their life cycle. We understand from studies of cat sharks and aquariums that they're able to distinguish between AC and DC fields, but not necessarily between artificial and natural fields. Um, in addition to that, those cat sharks have been studied further for their cognitive abilities, and it's been shown that they may well remember, uh, so they might be able to learn from past experiences, but their memory is quite short term. Um, later studies of uh, skates and rays, again, some of that was done in the cross sound cable, exposed them to uh, real cable electromagnetic fields, and they responded with an increase in exploratory and foraging behavior. So within even those just few studies that I've mentioned, you can see that there's a whole variety of species that have been studied and they've been studied in quite different ways. So there's different endpoints. And this produces actually quite a, a, a patchwork of information that we, we that's available for us to draw on. But it also produces the, the number of studies, uh, or sorry, the number of methods that are available to us going forward to continue studying this. I'll just briefly review them just now. So in terms of the techniques that are available, you can use free ranging studies or mesocosm studies, such as the study that we did in the cross sound cable, or you can take the organisms into the aquarium and look at them in a more controlled environment. So there's a range of uh, natural versus artificial conditions that you can use, uh, and with that comes a, a change in the degree of control that you have. Within each of those techniques, there's a whole variety of exposures that can be used as well. So even within those studies that we looked at, you can have AC or DC exposures and a range of intensities have been used as well, ranging from nanotesla through to microtesla, all the way up to millitesla. And then there's also the spatial and temporal variability. So you can produce a, a gradient of electromagnetic field, which is more representative of a cable EMF because it does change in the field. Um, or you could uh, produce a more static, uh, a, sorry, a more stable um, uniform field and see the response to that. You also have the temporal change in terms of how, they, uh, how long they're exposed to it, ranging from uh, days of even hours, days through to weeks. And so as we consider the information that's available to us and also as we plan and for uh, further studies going forward, we have to consider the relevance to the offshore wind industry. I think that's really important. In order to advance our understanding, uh, we've talked a little bit about the pressure. So in this case, that's the, the EMF and the receptor is the species that we're interested in. We need to draw on both of those things to be able to uh, manage the, the, the potential for impact. Um, and in order to do that, I'd like to suggest that we really need to take the vantage point of the receptor species. And what I mean by that 
is to really try to consider their position in space and time, how they perceive their sensory environment, which cues it is that are important to them at that time. So pulling the layers of information together requires us to consider their sensitivity and their abilities to detect electromagnetic fields and how that varies through their life cycle, as well as how it varies with their movement ecology through their life cycle, because that's what's going to inform their encounter rate. That is how often it is that they're likely to come across a cable and a cable EMF. And in addition to that, for the studies that we are designed to try and address this, they can be better informed by the type of cable properties that will influence the EMF. And that includes the, the position of the cable, the interaction with the local geomagnetic field, the different cable attributes that we talked about, as well as the energy supply, which is a spatial temporal variability electromagnetic field that will be produced. And then just to think about the broader context of offshore wind, this uh, helps to exemplify uh, how things may change through a species life cycle as well. Um, so here you have the life cycle of the lobster and these authors have tried to establish how that life cycle uh, at different stages will be influenced by the effects of offshore wind. If I draw your attention to over here, then you have a juvenile lobster that's potentially burying in the seabed that might increase its distance sorry, become closer to the cable, so it increases exposure to electromagnetic field. Whereas down here you have a lobster, which is an adult, and it's passing, passing through the array, possibly interacting with the cables as it goes, sorry. Um, and in addition to that, you also have um, these, the potential for rock dump or mattressing to provide uh, like an artificial reef effect for them. You have evidence of that here, so this is a European lobster taking residence in the rock armour over a cable. The cable isn't even energised yet, so it's got nothing to do with the EMF, it's simply found a shelter. And you can also see that at um, the Block Island Wind Farm cable mattress shown there with the lobster sheltering underneath it. So you just have to think about how these things interact together. Electromagnetic fields are not something that are produced uh, with no other effects either. Okay, so I can leave you with some resources of interest. Um, as Pat mentioned, my uh, review is available and there's another review from the State of the Science or if you're interested in our cross sound cable, lobster and skate work, those studies are there too. Um, I think I can stop there, and just say thank you to my, both my co-authors, but also all, all of you. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you. Could you go back? There was a chart, chart with some peaks and valleys on it, for lack of uh, the layperson's term. And uh, someone had asked in the chat, like explain those a little bit of the peaks and valleys. It's like early on in your slides, I think. Um, Peak, these? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Could we explain this a little bit more? Uh, sure. So the, the this is essentially a model of the the peak, the, the intensity of the electromagnetic field. So distance along the seabed. So the cable is uh, presumably buried somewhere around here. It's at one meter. And so the peak intensity of the electromagnetic fields, in this case the magnetic field, varies with the different cables that are being shown. Uh, and then you have a different signature of the, uh, the magnetic field as well. So you might have peaks and then dips. And quite often that comes from where you have more than one cable positioned in the seabed. Um, and we also showed in our study of the cross sound cable that sometimes you have a peak followed by a dip. Uh, so it's not always a raised intensity, you might have a decrease in intensity as well. Um, and so that's influenced by how it interacts with the, the local geomagnetic field. Great. And just so I just so I understand. So roughly at I'm winging it here, but like 12 to 13 meters either side, it falls roughly to zero. But within that, there's some kind of potentially influence on, as I look at this AC graph. Yeah, so um, I think typically you're seeing like between five and 10 meters it's gone. Some of them are pushing out between 10 and 20 meters for the AC field and for the DC. Uh, so our cross down cable, we, the, 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 the magnetic field, sorry, uh, spanned out to five to 10 meters either side of the cable. Uh, but the AC field that we found actually spans much further, like over 100 meters or up to 100 meters. So it depends on the properties of the cable that you're studying. Great, good, thank you. So um, other questions from folks about EMF and its potential impacts on marine species. So um, the, um, and could you, uh, Chris asked if you could discuss a little bit more the difference between an effect and an impact, right? Because an effect might be some kind of influence, but it may not have uh, adverse consequences. Could, could you speak to that? Yeah, 
Sure. So um, making the distinction between effects and impacts is quite well defined by Bohart at Gill. If you want to read about it more, that was published in 2010. And really, the, the idea of an effect is that, OK, so an animal responds. So, uh, for example, if you expose an animal to a magnetic field, you detect a behavioural response. But an impact would have to take into consideration how that effect would occur and have a, an influence in the population. So it's a population level response that you're looking at of an impact. And it also take consideration of the severity and the magnitude of that impact as well. And so you really have to translate. Um, so a lot of the studies that have been done, like even our study in the mesocosm where we detected the response of the lobsters to the magnetic field or the EMF of the cable, um, that's, that's great, that's useful information. We have to put that into the real life context of the animal and how it would interact with the cable EMFs and whether or not it would influence the population of the animals that are being studied. Right. And a question is, you know, people think about, you know, research they might be interested in going forward. I, I, I'm going to make an assumption, but tell me if I'm wrong, is that it might be easier to study effects than impacts unless the impacts are severe, just because impacts can be harder to measure in the end. Is that true or not? So I think that at this point in time, we're very much trying to understand what the effects are, and then we have to uh, try and understand how to translate that into a population um models. Uh, in addition to that, we have to be able to take effect or take consideration of cumulative effects. So the idea that even a small effect on its own might not be that big a deal, but if it's a repeated effect or it occurs um, sequentially over space and time, uh, or even an animal is exposed to something and responds early in its life stage, does it affect it later in its life stage? So they're called cumulative effects, where um, something small, which seems insignificant, may actually still become important if it's a repeated effect. Great. No, thank you. And then there's another question, which is, are there active EMF studies on marine life of some kind going on in Europe currently? Is it just modeling and aquarium studies? Like how much is out there in the field kind of being trying to be studied? Um, so there are uh, there are ongoing studies on elasmobranchs in Europe. Um, I'm familiar with some of the work that's going on there. Elasmo, oh, sorry, if I can say it properly, Elasmo Power is uh, the name of the project. And so they will be looking at the effects on, on on benthic elasmobranchs and, and how they interact with offshore wind cables. Um, a lot of the studies that are done uh, are taking place in aquariums. Um, that's still useful information, it's just that we have to use that information and interpret it in, in the context of offshore wind. And uh, another question is, are there any other naturally occurring localized disturbances that are comparable to sea cables that we can learn from? Um, Sorry, could you say that again? Are there any other naturally occurring localized disturbances that we can learn from comparable in some fashion to sea cables? Okay, so um, actually cables are a little bit unique in terms of the EMF that they produce. There are other magnetic anomalies, uh, such as um, like magne magnetic in, uh, deposits in the sediment. And you can also um, consider some of the literature on magnetic fields that are produced from bridges. However, they are they're like, they're stable components, okay? So they're not necessarily something that, that's gonna change. Whereas the power level that goes through a cable uh, means it's a spatial temporally variable entity. In terms of how animals interpret that, that that's quite different. And uh, particularly with the context of whether or not they'd be able to learn from it. Great. Um, two, at least two more questions. How does the intensity of the EMF field compare to the geomagnetic background of the Earth's field? And is the induced field enough to disrupt animal geomagnetic navigation? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so the, the geomagnetic fields ranges from between 25 and 65 microtesla, typically. Um, and quite often it's stated that the, the magnetic field that's emitted from a cable doesn't necessarily matter because it's below the geomagnetic field. But actually animals would respond to the gradient of change. And so that argument doesn't really hold up. Um, uh, what would be better is to really consider how the emission interacts with the local geomagnetic field and, and the anomaly that's produced. Even though we're talking about, in some cases, small micro Tesla changes. So for example, the cross sound cable, when we did our study, um, it was a maximum intensity of uh, 65. So I think that was like 14 micro Tesla above the background level, but that was still enough to elicit a response. Um, and that's a relatively small range, but if you consider it in context of what the surrounding a geomagnetic field is that's quite high, a 14 microtesla. If you translate that into nanotesla, it's multiplied by thousands. 
<coughs> excuse me. In terms of the uh, induced electric field, it depends on the species as to which component it is that they would be responsive to. Um, the, and, and that depends on how they, how they interact with the geomagnetic field. If they're actually detecting the magnetic field, then the induced electric field may not be um, from the cable might not be important, but in the case of elasmobranchs, for example, um, they are likely to be responding to the, the electric field or their emotionally induced electric field as they pass through it, although there is recent evidence that they might have a magnetosensitive sensitive apparatus as well. I'm sorry, that's not a straightforward uh, answer, but that is the case. And do you like this is this is probably too simplistic, but has a research shown like a hierarchy of which species or marine life are most affected by EMF and those that are maybe least sensitive to any EMF? No, actually, um, there's emerging evidence that more species than we would necessarily have thought of might be responsive to it, but it's difficult to um, generalize because a lot of the studies, for example, some of the aquarium studies that are done are at much higher levels than what we would consider. Um, like, so there's studies that look at the geomagnetic field, look at more natural intensities, and a lot of studies that are done in the aquarium might look at a uh, higher intensities, and there's like, like a huge gap in between. So we can't really uh, make those assumptions as to which species would be responsive and which wouldn't. Um, in terms of how they use the, the, these cues, the natural cues that are presented, and the ecological importance is, is something that we consider. Um, the elasmobranchs, for example, are actually very well studied, uh, both in terms of their sensory system, so that gives us a better ground for, for understanding those animals. Um, and because we have that better understanding, we tend to focus on, on them and, and how, they, how they use it. But there's lots of other species that respond or that uh, presumably use the geomagnetic field for migrations that might be important. Um, and I think recent evidence uh, from salmon has shown that it might be responsive to only two or three hundred nanotesla changes in terms of uh, changing the migration route. Right. So, um, I know you, you have to go, so I have one last question for you, and then we will let you go because we know you have a deadline. Is, are there studies on the effects or impacts on marine mammals? Not specific to cables. There are, there are studies that have been done on, on marine mammals, um, for example, natural uh, electromagnetic events have been shown to induce strandings, but they are not the same as a, like we can't use that to infer how they would respond to cable EMS. Great, thank you Zoe, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, if you don't mind, uh, stop sharing your screen. We'll hand it back to Joel. Oh, yeah. so appreciate that. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot I was still sharing. Oh, no worries, and great questions and really appreciate the time and expertise, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. You bet, thank you. And everyone, we will try to make, once we get the approval of presenters, we'll try to make these slides available um, on the on the general sort of uh, sort of uh, sort of offshore uh, offshore wind uh, websites, you all can have access to these at, at later, including those so citations. All right, um, I'm going to move back to Joel, who is going to. Uh, I think Joel, one question before we go to offshore cables, in particular in, in floating technology, is there was a question about decommissioning transmission cables. Mm -hmm. uh, as we finish your last part, do you mind answering that first, and we'll hand it back to you. Sure. Uh, so decommissioning cables in general is very local, um, uh, locally generated response. So if it, once a cable is decommissioned, uh, it in some places, oftentimes it's just left there uh, because to remove it would uh, redisturb the seabed. So oftentimes these cables will have a minimum of a 20 year lifespan, maybe even more. If it's buried a couple of meters in the seabed and has been there for 20 to 30 years, then it's more disruptive to remove it rather than uh, to just leave it where it is. So that's often the, the way that it's handled and not just with power cables, with telecommunications cables as well. Um, but if there is a desire to have it removed, then it, the reverse of the process that I talked about earlier is undertaken. The cable itself is deburied. Uh, you bring in the same tool and uh, it would, basically go through and unbury the cable, and then you would retrieve it to the back deck of a vessel as you went. Um, and this happens quite frequently as well. Like I said, local, local regulations really dictate which is the way to go. And uh, in that case, as you debury, sometimes the cable will come right out, sometimes it won't, and then you have to do it, you have to cut it and do it in pieces. And then the cable is often, because it's so much copper in these cables, it's often recycled. Uh, for, you know, obviously the copper is really valuable, so it's re recycled for other uses. Um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Specifically, as it relates to 
how it's going to work for offshore wind it's too early to say because the oldest wind farms are you know only 15 years so those cables have a lot of life left in them great that's great thank you uh, uh great terrific so we're ready for kind of cabling in the uh floating offshore wind sort of space so really over to you okay um so thanks to zoe that was fascinating i always find that those uh, EMF presentations fascinating because um, understanding the interface between what we're doing and what's happening with the local um, environment, I think is, I mean, it provides a great opportunity. The wind farm provides a great opportunity to do types of um, uh, scientific studies and related um, research be, as we're all learning what works and what doesn't. And I was especially noticing the difference in cable design uh, and how that seemed to impact uh, the way the EMF uh, readings came back. Um, the cable design is gonna be the uh, topic of this next one. We're talking about floating offshore wind and what this is all about. Um, I'm gonna just pick up where I left off. Uh, I talked, I showed you a little bit about uh, cable installation uh, assets. One of the smartest ways to design an array field and export cable too, of course. And we just talked about um, how you might do a uh, decommissioning. The other question that is attached to that is how you might do a repair. And so when I talk about this, it's, it's designing a system uh, that can be repaired. If you, if you think about just doing construction and maintenance is someone else's problem in the future, then you're inevitably going to, in my opinion, you're going to increase the cost of maintenance and increase the likelihood that maintenance is going to have to be done at a higher level of frequency. I would say um, kind of um, emergency maintenance. If it's designed to be maintained, then you're going to be knowing where your high risk areas are and you're going to be able to proactively be inspecting those, minimizing what your downstream um, uh, repair issues are going to be. So de deburring a cable and repairing it, just like removing it, comes with a, a whole process associated with it and obviously minimizing that. It's necessary, it's part of the industry, uh, but if you can minimize that, it's a good thing. These are examples, this is from our fleet. Um, most of these are from our fleet, but it, one of the things that's important to remember is that there's not a single vessel on site. So in an array field in particular, you have, remember that diagram I showed earlier where you have the turbine, substation, turbine, and shore end, in this case, we're talking about the substation to the turbine and then from one turbine to the next to the next in a daisy chain. And those chains can be any, you know, anywhere from five or six to 10 plus turbines. And they're normally gonna be between one and two kilometers apart. I think the distance between them is getting wider or broader as the um, turbines get bigger and the wake effect needs to be managed. I'm not an expert at turbine siting, but it's logical that you know, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that one turbine isn't blocking the wind to the next one. And so the design, the layout of the, um, of the turbine array or the turbine foundations is gonna dictate how the array is done. So in the array field, you need a DP2 vessel uh, and then you, those vessels are gonna be able to uh, move around the field. And then you're gonna also need tower teams and that imagine you've got, the two, you've got the two turbines that you're laying a cable between and the team is on one, you pull the cable, you terminate the cable, and then you lay it between the turbines and you pull it up to next. Uh, and then there's teams moving back and forth and those teams are moved around by either the primary lay vessel itself or a CTV type vessel, in this case, a, work to, a walk to work type vessel. Um, and then there's all kinds of intermediate type vessels that you see on projects that are appropriate to the location or what the, what the developer wanted to see. So vessel selection has a massive impact on how quickly and how compliant you're gonna be when it comes to things like warranties, local environmental considerations, impact on the environment and the like. Um, and, and this is uh, especially important when you're then thinking about what are the tools I'm gonna to use to do the job. So the, to, to talk about dynamic, you have to kind of get the lay of the land here. So you're gonna have a tool that's gonna to do the cutting of the cable and each cable is gonna come with a warranty that's gonna tell you what the bend radius is. I can't bend it anymore beyond that. And um, what the, the uh, amount of tension that I can put on the cable. So beyond that, it might start ripping itself apart. The amount of torque or twist I can put on the cable. Imagine a extension cord at your house after you've had it for 10 years 
you un unfurl it and it's got all these twists and twirls in it. You did not want to see that in a wind farm, especially on an array field. So what does the, what does the warranty say about that? And how does your tool prevent, um, prevent you from going outside of warranty? Um, and then you have excavation tools. We talked a little bit about rods earlier. There's different types of ROVs that, that um, remove the soil and then replace the soil in different ways, depending on the local conditions and local permits. Um, this is something that people are all often interested in. This is a joint. Um, uh, so a, a power cable joint is much larger than a telecoms cable joint. Uh, the, at the, ideally, you want to minimize those, but sometimes you have to have to have a joint. So the way the joints are installed at sea uh, and then housed and laid down is also a key part of the design of the system and a key part of how you would maintain the system because you have to go and put in a new cable at some defect in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the system, you're gonna have to put in one of these and how that's treated and then how that's uh, protected over time becomes a, um, a key part of maintaining that wind farm. This one here is really interesting too because it, uh, PLP 240, this is a prelay plow. So in the case where you have a, a lot of cobble or small stones or boulders, or you wanna have a route that you know when you're coming through with the cable, that is, is a clean route, you would go through and clean uh, and move the boulders out of the way. And this is a very large tool that was developed uh, alongside kind of boulder picking techniques to, to prep a route for a cable to come in. It's 100% dependent on the geography of the route, whether you need that, but this is a very new tool. And you can see how big it is. Here's the guys kind of standing next to it. So these tools are big and uh, they're all very well proven and they're all very specific to a purpose. So dynamic cables um, and Joel, a floating sorry, wind farm. Joel, sorry to interrupt you. Real quick, because there was a question that just for you, I think you probably addressed now and I would normally not try to do this. There's a question about the Jones Act and yep. these vessels, which, you know, for the mariners at sea, this is a, a longstanding law and obviously important. Can you just explain a little bit how these all relate to the Jones Act, at least briefly? Sure. The Jones Act applies to vessels, of course, not equipment. Um, and the Jones Act applies to... Uh, cable ships differently than other vessels. There may be some other vessels that are treated like cable ships. I wouldn't know about that, but the way that the Jones Act is written is that cable ships themselves are, uh, foreign cable ships are allowed to work in US waters. So if anyone has ever seen uh, a big interconnector being laid, you know, Long Island Sound has one. Uh, there's some out in the Pacific Northwest. There's not that many. Uh, but those would have been laid with a foreign cable ship, foreign flag cable ship, uh, probably with shallow water support by a local company. Um, the Jones Act allows that to, uh, to be done. Um, why that exemption or why that rule was written in the 1920s, uh, I couldn't tell you, but that's how the Jones Act works. So what you do in that case, a company like ours that has foreign vessels and from a jobs opportunity, this is something that often comes up from speaking for Global Marine. What we do is make sure that we are maximizing job opportunities locally. So what clients want to see is a vessel that has a um, resume. So I think one of the important things to uh, think about is that, well, maybe you wouldn't know this, but cable installate, cable issues, let's call it, cable issues represent a large portion, well over 80% of the insurable losses of the offshore wind industry to date. But we only represent maybe 15% of the total project cost. So that's really disproportionate. It's really problematic. And it's, be, it's some, sometimes it's because people that are doing the cable installation um, are doing it for the first time and, and, and it's kind of new and, and not necessarily the expertise is there. Other times it could be a cable manufacturing defect, although that's, that's unusual. Um, other kinds, it could be just, you know, that the project was not designed correctly. So there's all kinds of reasons why that happens. Uh, but one of the most important things you can do to mitigate cable problems is use a vessel that's done it before. So the vessels that have pulled, you know, without like Symphony over here, our fleet, you know, th this is a vessel that's probably pulled hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of cables for offshore wind. Uh, there's only a few examples of dynamic cables used for offshore wind. This is, the case, this is the vessel that's done it, or these are the vessels that have done it. Um, there are others that are, are similar to ours, but what you want is a vessel with the resume. And so using the benefits of the, the, the fact that the Jones Act allows a cable ship to work in US waters, 
but then maximizing the number of US mariners and US electricians that are trained to be on the, on the vessel uh, is a priority for us. Uh, and we really think that hybrid works and you get a vessel with a resume, but you get American jobs. So long answer to your short question, but happy to dig in further if you want. Um, the equipment, most of this type of equipment, there is equipment in the Gulf that can do this, but the Gulf equipment is primarily designed for work in the Gulf. The Gulf has very unique seabed conditions. Um, it also has different operating parameters. And so a lot of the tools that you'll see being done on the first wave of offshore wind projects in the US will probably be coming from Europe or purpose built for a specific situation. Um, so, uh, so dynamic cables. So if you go back to what we've been talking about, everything we've been talking about is, is right down at the seabed. The way that a traditional cable works uh, for a fixed space foundation is that cable used to run through a J-tube, now it runs primarily mostly through the inside of the foundation, pops out the bottom, uh, has cable protection on it, and then is buried as we've been talking about. In the case of a dynamic cable, when you don't have the foundation, here's Kikardin, for example, uh, which is one of the um, pilot projects off the coast of Scotland. Uh, it, it, when you don't have that attached to the seabed, uh, excuse me, the, the turbine itself isn't attached to the seabed, but in, in case uh, of deep water, it's floating, then you need what's called a dynamic cable. And this will be the case certainly in Maine because you're dealing with, I think, you know, a minimum of five or 600 feet of water. So not hyper deep like Hawaii 1500, but still way, way beyond what you're going to do with a fixed base um, foundation. So in this case, you would have the turbine anchored. Um, each anchoring system comes with its own set of parameters. Once the foundation is there and anchored, then we would come alongside or someone like us comes alongside. And, then, and rather than laying the cable on the seabed and then burying it, you're, this is the cable coming off the back deck of the vessel here on the left. You have the cable, clearly it has a different types of protective sheath. Um, and then it has these buoyancy units that are put on, onto it as it's going off the back of the vessel. And those buoyancy units are specifically designed to keep the cable in a specific shape in the water column once it's, um, once it's, being, once it's been laid. And what you, that shape is really determined by the design of the cable, the water depth, and the relationship of the foundation to the seabed. Um, you can, the shape is, you know, they, there's all kinds of different examples of the shapes, but they can be a, a, um, a U, it can be an S, it can be a double S, it can, there's lots of ways to do it. But essentially what you're doing is you're taking, you're offsetting the weight of the cable as it makes its way down to the seabed. That's why you have these buoyancy units. So the cable, if it were straight down, it would pull it, tend to pull itself apart over time because the weight of the cable and the water depth. In this case, it takes the weight of the cable off of itself and allows it to more um, man well, manageably go down to the seabed. At some distance from the foundation then, it makes it, uh, it touches down on the seabed. And then from that point on, it becomes a conventional uh, cable that is buried to whatever point it's going to. If it's another turbine in the string, then you would have another dynamic cable coming up and then up into the foundation and, and that's how you would that's how you would do it over the um, over the life of the field or I should say over the, uh, the design of the field at the substation itself in a floating substation scenario like someone asked about earlier you would have the exact same principles where you'd have a dynamic export cable coming off that's brought down via these dynamic buoyancy units to the seabed and then from there it becomes a conventional uh, burial. Dynamic cables are not particularly new. This is something that has been tried and true technology in uh, the offshore oil and gas industry for deeper um, water situations. Before offshore wind started using this at, at places like King Carden, um, it was done routinely uh, in deep water with floating oil rigs. So we, we cut our teeth on those projects historically. Um, but the opportunity here is not to just take the oil and gas technology and go with it. It's to think about how do we design it for the realities of an offshore wind farm that are going to have different dynamics than, of course, a single instance of a medium voltage cable at a floating oil rig. So I think there's a ton to be learned from oil and gas, but I think there's a ton to, to use that as a starting spot and design as needs for our industry as we go. Um, so these are the kind of common questions that often get asked for dynamic cables. So I'll just uh, move through them pretty quickly here. 
It's usually 36, uh, 33 or 66 kV. That's the same as a conventional cable. Um, as turbines get bigger, I'm sure that will be re-examined, but that's the state of the art today. Uh, I described to you uh, how the touch, uh, how the cable is laid and how the HDV duct works. Um, we install the uh, cable protection. Um, there's also a cable protection at the point where it touches down on the seabed to ensure that the, the bend radius of the cable is not exceeded as it's in the water column. How is it protected? We talked about this earlier with mattresses or rock dumping of some type. Um, but ideally, you want to see it as buried, buried as often as possible when it's obviously not in a dynamic situation. Um, the ROV we talked about earlier, target burial depths can be anywhere between one and three, depending on local project permits. Some people just assume deeper is better. It's not necessarily the case. If you have stiff soils, you don't need to go that deep. If you have very sandy soils, you may want to go deeper. So a good design is going to take the local uh, geology into account. And like I said earlier, is going to take the local uses into account and design it so that those uses are the minute, the impact on those uses is minimized and you've buried appropriately to make that happen. Uh, and then I said mattresses and again, mattresses that are designed using kind of local users uh, is absolutely the way to go. Um, and then also that those mat, you know, that those cables can be repair are repairable at some point in the future if, if that should be the case. And then we talked earlier about uh, how dynamic cables work um, and that it's mature technology. And I think that the, um, the one thing that's it's easy to get lost in in all of this is because a lot of what we've done here to date has been from the oil and gas industry. And I think what's really exciting about what Maine is doing, um, yes, California and the West Coast in general is also getting into this space. And yes, it's very active in Japan, uh, starting to be more active in Hawaii, but that's ultra deep water. That's even a different story there that, than you guys have. You've got the benefit of being kind of the only game in town where you have deep water on the East Coast, where Maine, the state of Maine, and probably I would say New Hampshire too, and coastal Massachusetts, but mostly Maine and New Hampshire because you have the ports, really have an opportunity to be uh, a model for how you develop the industry so that it does cohabitate with other users and also becomes kind of a, I think, a center of excellence for all types of research and development. The vessels to install this as a one-off, you could probably use vessels that exist today at scale. Um, I think that's a significant R&D opportunity for vessel design and evolving cable, ins or cable installation and actual wind farm installation vessel design. Foundation design, you guys already know about that. University of Maine's been a world leader in that for, I don't know, 10, 15 years now. Um, the overall design and operations and how that interfaces, you know, to me, that's a great opportunity for what Maine could do as far as setting itself up as a market leader, because there's no one else on the East Coast that has that the local assets that you guys have, because everything down here, I'm in Massachusetts, so everything south of Cape Cod is all on the shelf. So it's much more shallow. You have to go out way deeper and it'll be a while before anyone's building wind farms off the coast of New York or New Jersey in those kind of water depths. Um, I think also the manufacturing assembly of a lot of these components, you have a lot of deep water ports in Maine. I mean, Maine's marine her mar maritime heritage is built on the fact that you have deep water ports and this is just an updated version of that. So foundation designs, we talked about anchor designs. I think anchors are gonna be a key element of minimizing seabed uh, and water column um, footprint on here. How do, you, how do you keep those anchors so that, it, how do you keep those anchors so that those anchor chains and the pattern is minimized uh, and you don't have a big wide spread behind that? And I think that's a great opportunity for innovation that people are just starting to think about now. Cable protection. I'm not convinced that the cable protection we use today is ideal for the floating space. I think it's adapted, but I think there's a lot of innovation that could occur there. Um, I think there's also the idea that you could, in a, you could add in various sensors, uh, various communication devices that would, I think, interface well with various scientific research, stuff that Zoe was talking about, other types of ideas that I'm inevitably, you know, proper science scientists would be thinking about. And I think it's a perfect chance to get those types of things designed into a, to these types of systems because it's new. Um, Joel, and I think just because of time, Joel, I have a few questions I want to make sure we get to. So 
Maybe okay, just... no, I'm pretty much done. I was just kind of laying the groundwork because I do think it's, you see all this talk about the fixed space environment and you think, well, maybe all the heavy lifting has been done as far as design and innovation goes. And I guess my point on this slide is that could not be further from the case. Floating is a, is a uh, great opportunity to kind of rethink it all and uh, do it that's unique to that market. So I think that's my last slide on that one and it is. Beautiful, Joel, thank you so much. So I think I'm gonna, there's a number of good questions in the chat. So one is how can you accurately determine if the cable is flexing too much on a floating platform that will be moving up and down itself at different rates? You know, how do you plan for the movement of the turbine to offset chafing or bending of the cable, uh, especially when we may not have a full sense of how they are gonna move in the water over time and heavy, heavy seas, et cetera? Yeah, is that, so that's really a function of the cable design interface with the cable protection system. So speaking very gross gener generally is that you would have a, a window of movement that's permitted for that cable before it exceeds the vent radius. And then the way the cable protection and the way that the cable design and that dynamic installation is done um, would be engineered to be within that window. And I think that's a really key question because the interface between a floating foundation engineering, so the cable route into the foundation and the termination points in that foundation and the way that that's engineered for the dynamic connection and then the way that's ultimately engineered to the, uh, to the, to the floater, to the um, buoyancy units is really, really key, more so in ways than it is with a fixed space where you're really not gonna have that movement. So generally speaking, there's assumptions you can, you can design into it, but I also think that's an area of interface between engineering groups that really needs to be thought through project by project. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, next question, are dynamic cables ever embedded with remote sensors, acoustic other, for mapping local current and wildlife fish movements over time? So they become a, a sensor. Any, as well. any of the cable, yeah, I think in some umbilical cases that is the case, but that's exactly the, the um, so generally speaking, no, it's not a thing. Could it be a thing? I did not see why not, and I think that's a, a great challenge to the cable designers to say, well, what can we do? Because remember, there's a lot of firepower, uh, you know, there's a lot of fiber in these cables. So there's a lot of communications firepower in there that you could do other things with than just talking to the SCADA system. Now, that's me speaking. Um, cable designers or developers may not want to do that. But to me, that's a great opportunity to interface with a local community, whether it's research or folks that are trying to understand habitat. And why not? Because you're putting it there anyway. So why not have it talk to you? Great. Um, there's a question about, this is maybe more broad, but are for, for pilot flooding projects off the UK, are they likely to be reasonable analogs for what might develop in the Gulf of Maine in terms of depth, other considerations? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's not ultra deep water over there either. So I think it's a good analog in that um, technically this is the state of the art and here's some good projects. So like if, if we're talking about a project, I would reference that. However, I would say that only goes so far because the seabed conditions, the local users um, and the local permitting authorities are gonna have a lot to say about what's appropriate for Maine, for example. So I would use that absolutely as a base case and kind of what we know and how it works. But then I would say, okay, these are the differences and that Delta between them, that's really where the opportunity lies to really make it our own. And there's a question which is broadly about offshore technology. And so you may want to speak strictly to the cabling part, but I'll redo the whole question, which is what is the weakest link on a floating offshore wind platform? If a category five hurricane disabled the floating platform, platform, what would be most likely to fail? The turbine, the platform junction to the power cables, the seabed anchors, the turbine itself. You know, what's what's likely, what's likely to be uh, uh, at greater risk, if you can speak to that. In your expertise. Sure. I, I'm so I'm definitely not the right person to talk about anything having to do with turbines. I become as ignorant as the next person when you talk about turbines. But from the where the cable termination point is on the foundation down to the seabed, if it's been designed and installed correctly, you know you're you're anticipating currents. You're anticipating the um, the movement of the water. Uh, so and and there's a Obviously, there's a violent up and down motion there that should have been designed into the system when it was put out there. If it's been designed correctly, I'm not saying that would eliminate all risk, but I am saying that that's a design element that's somewhat knowable and should be designed into the way that the cable is manufactured and the way the cable is protected and installed. And I would expect those types of things to be minimum. Minimal. I think you know you're going to have a certain minimum number of of uh, chains uh, holding that bag or, or um, tension points uh, holding that foundation in. Again, the foundation, the interface between the foundation designer 
and the cable uh, design manufacturer in that cable route will, will determine whether or not those extreme weather events become a problem. But in principle, there's nothing from an engineering standpoint that is not, you shouldn't be able to anticipate. Great. Um, as we begin to come close in our time, just a few minutes left, any additional questions people want to pose to Joel around that good presentation on floating technology and the dynamic cables? Um, I'll note that, uh, again, this session is being recorded. We'll post this up on the State of Maine's website, so it's available to folks who want to listen again, capture more detail. Uh, as Stephanie noted in the chat, a great example for, you know, we'll put up the slides and the like um, and make those available. I, one question, good, Lance, thank you. There's another question that was raised I want that comes back to more maintenance generally. Are there maintenance loops included to allow the cable to be lifted to the service for splice repairs? If so, are these loops also buried? How is that handled? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so cable repair is something that the industry was woefully unprepared to think about. There was an, and I sat in many of these insurance presentations back in the day where people believed that once the cable was buried, it would never be a problem, would never fail. Because on land, that's kind of the case, but seabed's a different world. And so the way that it works is that if you've got a, buried, a, a cable that's been buried and has a fault of some type, you unbury it, you pull it back to the surface and then you lay in a, you lay in a splice. And so you splice one end and then you lay that back down on the seabed and, and then you move to the other side, splice that in, lay the whole thing back down. And so that, and, and sometimes uh, the joint, well, you saw the picture of the joint earlier, not sometimes every time the joint is required in order to make that splice uh, happen and, and warrant the repair. Um, that's a, Roughly speaking, um, that's for every thousand miles of kilo thousand kilometers of cable installed, there's gonna be a repair on an annualized basis. So right now in Europe, you're starting to see a fairly predictable number of repairs happen because there's so much cable in the water. That, that, will, take, that will happen here. And we just need to design systems that you can repair in as, um, you know, uh, I would say planful way as possible. But yeah, you have to debury it, pick it up, Put the splice in, lay it back down. And Joel, one last question on that, and then one last question before we wrap is, um, and does that actually does, it, does that that spliced or repaired cable then go at the same depth that was buried in a rivery? Does it have to go back down to six feet or whatever the requirement was? Yeah, usually that. So it'll talk about that. What the whatever the permit says is what you need to do. So the issue then becomes, you know, have I designed my corridor wide enough so that I can lay that you know, I can lay that splice in because it's. Remember, in that case, you know, you're, you've just lost your straight line and you're now gonna have, you're now gonna have um, extra cable because you had to pick it up in the seabed. You're gonna have to lay that in an S or some type of a, um, you know, a, a warranty friendly way on the seabed. And then you're gonna have to protect that. Could it be buried again with an ROV or does it have to be mattressed or rock protected? It'll be situational. Great, um, and one last question before we wrap because of time is, uh, are there sensors in the cable or some means that apart from literally physically inspecting it, that you can determine if there's a break or maintenance or damage that's needed for repair? Yeah, that's what, that's a great question. So what we've been working on throughout, the, when you get a cable buried at a couple meters, it's very hard to find again. It's very deep and the signature is very faint. Uh, so finding it again is rough. So there's been all kinds of really interesting techniques being in progress. And again, this is an area of, of active innovation where between the heat signature of the cable and the, um, and the fiber communication of the cable, you can begin to pinpoint where that fault is occurring or if the fault has, uh, if there is a fault developing. So there are ways to do that. And those ways are, um, to me, uh, getting better and will be in a great area of innovation. I know a lot of software companies and other kind of people that do head end equipment on these systems are putting a lot of effort into that now. So in the next five years, I would expect that to be an area of real um, uh, active development. Great, Joel, thank you. So I wanna thank both Zoe and Joel for great presentations. Appreciate their time and professional opinions as we share about cabling generally in the Gulf of Maine and broadly around offshore wind development. So again, thank you. Thank you all very, very much for joining. Stephanie has nicely put kind of where presentations and recordings can be found as well as a few other links in the chat as well. Um, so we appreciate everybody joining. I uh, look forward to gearing on more of those to help people learn and understand. Thank you again so much and everybody have a terrific and hopefully warming spring. So thank you all, be well. <laughs>
Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you.